So my name is Natalie Shlomo. I'm a new member of staff in the social statistics uh, discipline here in uh, the University of Manchester. And I'm very pleased to have been asked to participate in this Methods of Manchester series. And uh, the topic that I chose are what are survey weights. Now obviously it's important to know about survey weights when you're a survey methodologist like me and we're actually designing and implementing surveys and providing the estimation uh, resulting from surveys. And of course, uh, you know, really good reason why we under need to understand survey weights. But for those of you who are analyzing survey data, in particular complex survey data, I think it's really important to understand the motivation and how the sample weights are calculated and perhaps to convince researchers and users of the data to actually use the survey. So there you have a nice picture of the target population and from among the target population I select my sample and we can define now an, uh, uh, an inclusion probability. It's often known as the first order inclusion probability and this is the probability of being part of the sample. So given I've drawn a single sample, what is the probability that an element or unit in the population is selected into the sample? Now each element of the population might have a different probability of being selected in the sample. That depends on the su uh, survey design, and so we're not going to go there. That will be another uh, what is talk about sample uh, survey designs, but the uh, point in... Uh, the sample is that everybody has to have a positive probability of being selected. Because once we get elements in the target population with zero probabilities to be selected, then we're getting into the realm of non-probability uh, samples, quota sampling you may have heard of, or snowballing. And the idea is, the problem there is that we can't make generalizations to our target population. But once we have a proper random sample where every element of the population has a positive probability of being selected, then we can make inference and generalizations to the population. In the simplest case, all of the units in the population might have the same probability of being selected. Uh, that's often called the simple random sample. Many of you have heard of that. And the idea is that the inclusion probability then is simply the sample size over the population size. Sample size I denote by little n and population size by cap n and the inclusion probability would simply be little n over cap n. So once I have my inclusion probability, we can uh, develop a survey weight. It's often called a design weight. So I denote my, by that Greek letter pi, pi i, the probability of selection of element i in my population. And the sample weight in this simple case um, is the uh, inverse of the inclusion probability. So it's 1 over pi i. It, that's often called the design weight because this is the result of the design of my survey. So I denote that by di. It's 1 over the inclusion probability. And basically what that says is that the unit i in the sample represents di individuals in the population. So in this example, if pi i is 1 out of 100 persons that I'm selecting from my population, uh, then d i is 100. And for example, if the population has 500 people and I selected 5 people, because my inclusion probability is 1 out of 100, then each sample person represents 100 in the population. Right? Simple, straightforward. So the design weight or the sample weight in this simple case is simply 1 over the inclusion probability. And then in terms of my estimating, I want to be able to estimate a population parameter and I can make generalizations to the population because I have a proper random sample. Uh, and the population parameter in this case, uh, if I want to look at the population total, so if I denote by y the, some value, for example, y might be how much the household spends on food or the total turnover in a business, okay? So if y represents the value, that large sigma means sum of. So I'm summing over all the values of y in my population and that u denotes the population. So the population parameter in this case for a total, 
uh, denoted by capital Y, and how I estimate now from my sample this population parameter is uh, often it's called the Howitz Thompson estimator, and it's simply taking each of the values of the Y in the sample now, right? Little s is the sample, so I'm summing over the sample, taking the values that I that I obtained from my sample and weighting them by di. So di times yi, summing across all the sample units, that's the Hollywood's thompson estimator, an unbiased estimator for the population parameter, uh, in this case, the population total. And di is one over pi i. So that's all very simple. So basically, I'm pretty much done with my talk. I told you what a survey weight is and how we can get a uh, unbiased estimates, but the problem isn't uh, so straightforward because we have lots of complications in our surveys, as we know. And one of the main problems in our surveys is the problem of non-response. So non-response happens when a selected unit doesn't provide the requested information. And of course, this is out of the control of the researcher, and we're not sure what mechanism these, uh, this uh, response probability is arising from. Um, and this obviously affects the quality of the estimates, and we'll see some examples of that throughout this talk. So non-response is a huge issue and uh, very problematic, affects the quality of our estimation. Um, and we need to think about two types of uh, non-response. Um, we can have a unit non-response where the selected unit provides absolutely no information whatsoever. Um, and, uh, and we can differentiate that with item non-response. Sometimes they might start the questionnaire, start the process. We've got some preliminary information about the uh, unit, but they sort of drop off um, at some point. So some questions have been answered. Now for item non-response, we typically deal with that through imputation, imputation methods. That will be another talk on what is. Uh, but for unit non-response, the typical treatment for those not responding are through adjusting the survey weights. So survey weights will also compensate for those units that aren't responding. So often, when we have non-response, we look at it as a two-phase approach to our surveys. So we would start with the population denoted by U, and from the population select our sample S, and we know the mechanism for selecting that sample through our design and our inclusion probability. But we also have the second phase, which is the respondent phase. So we view the response as sort of a second stage of sampling, and that mechanism for producing these respondents is unknown, and we need to estimate it. So um, we can define our pi, what I defined early, pi i, and this time I, I denote it by pi si, and that's the uh, inclusion probability. Unit i is selected in my sample, and that depends on the design. And we can also define a conditional probability of the respondents given I selected that element in the sample. So the unit I responds condition on the fact that I selected that unit in the sample. And then the final inclusion probability would be the multiplication of the two probabilities. Probability of response given it's selected in the sample times the inclusion probability. So we have the uh, probability that unit I is selected and responds. Now when we design our surveys, we know the inclusion probability and that's not a problem. The problem is that we need to estimate this response probability given it was selected into the sample. Okay, so this is out of control of the researchers. So we need to estimate this response probability. And uh, what's typically done is that we assume that it depends only on the person and not actually on the sample selection. So we sort of remove that condition on being actually selected to the sample. 
So I'm going to note, denote this pi r conditional on the sample just as a theta i, theta i. So uh, theta i is defined as the response probability of unit i. And uh, we need to estimate that theta i, and then we can incorporate that into our um, survey weights. Now, when we think about unit now response, we can think of a um, sort of two cases. The first case, which we call sort of non-selective non-response, and what that means is that there's absolutely no uh, difference between the respondents and the non-respondents. So, for example, if I was wanted to um, carry out a survey on how much persons are spending on their food for the expenditure survey, uh, it's, po it's possible that the non-response is completely random and that um, the characteristics of the respondents and non-respondents are the same. In other words, if I calculated the average expenditure for food for the respondents and compared them, you know, hypothetically to the average um, expenditure for the non-respondents, they would be the same. They would be equal. So we call that non-selective non-response. And if that's the case, then we simply weight up our respondents or gross up our respondents to the sample level by calculating simply the proportion of the responding. So theta i would be the number of completed interviews out of el uh, el eligible elements divided by my sample size. So the number of respondents divided by my sample size. So we can sort of gross up to the sample level and then how do we get to the population level, right? Doing our design weights. But that's often rarely the case where we can assume that the characteristics of the respondents are equal to the non-respondents. That hardly ever holds true. And in the other case, we would have selective uh, non-response. So that would be the case where those that are responding, we actually know for income surveys that those aren't responding are usually the ones with the very high incomes, but also the very low incomes. So it's not the case that those that aren't responding are similar in characteristics those that are responding. It's usually the opposite. And so to deal with selective non-response, we need to assume some sort of model where theta i is fixed within subgroups, or we call weighting classes or adjustment cells. So perhaps if I'm able to um, divide up the problem not in the general sense, but maybe in weighting classes, for example, perhaps those with the same household size, uh, having uh, the same type of household, they would have similar expenditures as opposed to a different household, you know, where there's um, a different type of, uh, type of household. So if we could sort of build these weighting classes based on some auxiliary information that we know, and that these weighting classes are correlated to our target variable, in this case, expenditure, then we can assume that within the weighting class, we would have uh, non-selective non-response. Okay, so that we can, within a weighting class, within the subgroup, take the ratio of respondents to the sample size. So if we can somehow build these weighting classes that are homogeneous with respect to our Y variable, to our target variable, then in each subgroup, we can gross up to the survey level by taking the proportion of completed interviews divided by the sample size in that subgroup. And then once we weight up to that survey level, again, then we can um, gross up to the population level using our design weights. So there's, so there's uh, implicit modeling going on here. We need to assume that we have these um, auxiliary information for example, if we were uh, assessing um, income and I wanted to gross up uh, the, um, the, or deal with the response, we know obviously the gender is very correlated with um, income. And so you'd want to perhaps gross up separately for men and women because they would have different um, characteristics. So you see we have sort of this two level approach where we need to take the respondents, gross them up to the sample level, 
uh, using uh, and taking into account the selective non-response that's going on. And then once we get them up to the sample level, we can gross up to the um, population level. We can also use some uh, explicit modeling to estimate response probabilities besides the uh, trying to um, you know, develop the subgroups or weighting classes. And one popular method is actually to use, use a logistic regression model. So we assume we've got our sample and we've denoted by one all of those that are responding. So our dependent variable is R and R takes the value of one if it's a responded and zero if it's non-response. So we can carry out a logistic regression to estimate the probability or propensity to respond. Explanatory variables, again, would be these auxiliary variables that we would know for the respondents and the non-respondents, so they'd have to be known, which is why we usually don't model on the actual target variable, like income, because we don't know the income for the non-respondents. But we have a set of auxiliary information that is known, um, hopefully that's correlated to our target variable, and uh, so things like gender, age, those sort of things that we know. And we can fit a logistic regression model and get a uh, estimate for the propensity to respond. Now often in the literature, uh, we uh, typically might use this propensities either to gross up that individual to the sample level, um, but often we might use the uh, theta i's to uh, define weighting classes. So we use the predictions to define better weighting classes um, than what we did before based on just cross-classifying auxiliary information. So, um, and there's also another method that's often used, and this is the segmentation algorithms. Um, so as I said, logistic modeling is not conducive to produce actual weighting classes or adjustment cells, but there are segmentation methods, and one of them is CHAID, which is very popular because it's an SPSS, um, and it uh, splits up our survey data more sort of naturally. Uh, so using non-parametric methods, it splits our sample into subgroups in an optimal sense where it calculates the subgroups that are the most different in our response rates. So we want the groups that differentiate the maximum uh, in terms of the response rate. So for example, if we take a look at the refusals in the family expenditure survey, we had 4,825 in our sample with a 74.5 response rate. And if we run through this segmentation algorithm, it's going to tell me that actually the, household, the smaller households have uh, um, very different response rates than the larger households. So it'll tell me the first split, split by household size. And then once we have this split, it'll you know, split it further maybe by the occupation and other issues that are um, correlated with the response rate. So this is also a nice way to get our uh, weighting classes. So once I have my uh, estimated response probability, um, I can then calculate using the Howitz thompson estimator uh, for the population total. In this case, if you notice, there's a little r underneath the summation. So those are only the respondents now. We're summing across the respondents, dividing by pi i. But this time our pi i, if you recall, was our theta i times the design weight uh, inclusion probability. Or we can reverse that v i v i where VI is now one over the uh, response probability. So we're simply grossing up to the sample level and then using the design weight, grossing up to the population level. And our combined weight now is VI over uh, times DI. So we're still in Howard's Thompson estimator. There's, uh, as we know, uh, Howitz Thompson estimator is a wonder, you know, unbiased estimate, just fine. But it does produce estimates that have uh, larger variances. And one thing that we know in the sample methodology is that if we took a, a stratified sample where the strata are correlated with our target variables, uh, we would get much more efficient designs. We would get um, estimates that. Uh, for parameters with less variance 
than had we taken a simple random sample. Okay, this is well known in survey methodology. So what happens is that often we can't use stratified sampling, even though we know it's more efficient. And that's because our sample frames are not conducive to taking a uh, stratified sample. In our large government surveys, our sample frames are typically addresses. And they're not characteristics of the individuals in order you know, to be able to improve the survey design. We know that um, gender is correlated with income. So if I had a, a list of all the individuals, I would put the men separately and the women separately. And in each stratum, I would select a sample. But we can't do that because our sample frame are addresses. So in order to mimic this good practice of the good stratified sample designs in terms of the efficiency of our estimates, what we do is we take the sample and we divide the, after we've collected the sample, after post-collection, we can divide the sample into our strata or post-strata. And assuming that I know the population size in each strata um, from external sources, I can mimic as if I had carried out a stratified sample in advance. So we can find methods for survey weights will, which will actually bring down the vari variance compared to, say, the Horowitz Thompson estimator. The, the issue here, of course, is the sample size in each post strata is random. And so we have to ensure that we have a rather large set, you know, certainly over 15, 20 units in each post strata. So that's something you need to remember. So for example, let's take a look at this example. We have some parts of the uh, population that are under uh, underrepresented and uh, we can weight according to the sample of the population. So we'll see some examples for that. Uh, this is from this uh, Moser and Kaltz's book. What you have here are respondents and the proportion responding for men and women separately. Uh, and then you have the non-respondents. Again, this is a good auxiliary variable because I know for the respondents and I also know for the non-respondents. Um, and then this was the original sample. And then notice in this final column you have the population, right? So because I couldn't take in advance a stratified sample where I might have controlled in my sample to ensure that I would have the exact same proportions of the population, you can see that I have a little bit of selection uh, bias here. So even my sample is not completely mirroring the proportions in the population. So if we take a look at this table, we see that the response rate for men is uh, uh, 1,360 over 1,640 or 82.9%, and the response rate for women is 89.6%. So let's say that in this survey, I was uh, wanted to ask how many people are reading the daily tabloids. So uh, I had 1,360 men, and out of them, 1,088 were reading the tabloids, and for women, 176 out of 1,757. So 80% of the men in my survey um, were uh, reading tabloids, and 10% of the women and we can get the estimate for all respondents, 40.6. So if I don't take into account at all the survey weights, just the response, respondents, I end up with 40.6% are reading the daily tabloid. Now, if I wanted to gross up to the sample level and take my response-weighted estimates, I would end up with, you know, it, it, exchanging these proportions with the sample level, I would end up with 41.9%. Or if I do the post-stratification and use my population-based weighted estimates, I'd end up with 42.9%. So you can see that by reweighting the responses, um, you know, we get quite different results. So we use auxiliary popula uh, uh, population information. Number one, we're going to reduce the sampling error. We're going to have more efficient estimates, less variance. We're adjusting for the unit non-response. We are adjusting for non-coverage as well when we use population-based weighting. 
and uh, we can calibrate to external, external estimates. Now, I showed you an example using the population proportions. We can actually gross up and get uh, weighted estimates of totals. So if I know from the Office for National Statistics, these are the number of men in my uh, target population, and these are the number of women, I can also get an estimate for those reading uh, tabloids in all of the, out of the UK um, total population. So we, uh, it's uh, good to use the um, population estimates when we want actual figure, actual numbers, totals, point estimates. Now everything I said, uh, I mentioned it was based on sim simple random samples, you know, one uh, inclusion probability for all the elements in the sample. You can, uh, of course, many strategies, design, uh, survey design strategies will have different weights, inclusion probabilities. And one example, for example, uh, is uh, stratified sample design. Again, very typical in our government surveys uh, where they would uh, say boost an area of England like Scotland or Wales. You know, so they want to have a higher proportion of individuals in a particular area. Uh, as opposed to the other areas. So they would take a stratified sample design, for example, the strata would be Scotland, England, Wales, and perhaps for Scotland they would introduce um, a larger uh, weight, or, or um, um, design weight. So in each stratum we have a selection probability. In this case, we have an index now of H, which is a strata, little nh over cap nh, and they don't have to be equal. So coming out of the realm of simple random samples. Um, and we can get calculate our weighted means this way by summing across the uh, means in each strata times NH, cap NH. So that's a stratified um, estimate for the total or the mean. So if we wanted to get a uh, uh, mean, we would calculate the means in each strata, the averages, multiply by cap NH, and then uh, divided by the sum of NH. This is simply equal to N. Um, but if we wanted to get the uh, sample totals, then we're weighting by cap NH over little NH. So it does compensate for uh, differential inclusion probabilities. In this example, we have, a, again, England, Wales, and Scotland, and we're looking at the uh, percentage of uh, alcohol consumption. So you've got your sample size here and your um, Y variable, alcohol consumption, and the percentages. And if I told you that the sample fraction in uh, Scotland was double, in other words, the design weight of England and Wales is double uh, compared to Scotland, and then we can calculate our percentage of um, alcohol consumption in the country by ensuring that we have the proper representation of the individuals in our sample. So for Scotland, for England and Wales, we need to multiply by two, and Scotland would be the same. So just a little bit of interlude, on uh, because up to now I talked about equal inclusion probabilities, but of course we can also deal with the issue of non-equal inclusion probabilities. So here's a, an example on a smoking survey, just to uh, hopefully this uh, um, hits home a little bit. We've got two uh, primary sample units in our survey, selected by simple random samples out of 20 primary sample units. And then within each sample unit, we've got five households selected. And then within each household, we have one adult selected in the household. So very differential inclusion probabilities here because we've got two out of 20, then we have five out of the size or the number of households in the PSU, and then we have one over the size of the household. So if there's five people in the household, you have a one in five chance of being selected. If there's 10 people in the household, it's one out of 10. So very, very differential inclusion probabilities. Then we're looking at smoking status, uh, one if um, the person smokes, zero otherwise, and the number of cigarettes smoked per week. So here's our data. 
You've got the PSU, you've got the size of the PSU, NI, you've got MI, which is the household size, the pi i, as I showed you earlier, very differential for all of these individuals. And then you've got whether he smokes or not, and the number of cigarettes smoked. These, the design weight is one over the inclusion probability, and then you have the weighted, um, the weighted uh, counts. So the estimated percent of smoking is 61%, 6,900 over 11,300. And the estimated mean number of cigarettes smoked is uh, 42.6. Now, everybody responded, but they're very differential inclusion probabilities here. So what happens if I tell you, wait a minute, we've got three adults that did not respond. So adults two, four, and eight did not respond, and everybody else responded. And we're gonna look at two methods for these weighting classes that I defined earlier. Either we're just gonna weight the whole sample, in other words, non-selective, non-response, so all of the strata, or we can calculate weights, the um, response probability weights separately in the PSU. Okay, so in order to calculate um, the uh, non-response weighting, we're gonna go to the household level. The household level um, inclusion probability, again, is two out of 20 and then five out of um, cap and I. So if we looked at this household, assuming the non-response is uh, at a household level, uh, we can see what the full, uh, what the design weight is at the household level, and then of course we have uh, adult two and adult four not responding, so they have zero weight to them because they did not respond. So in this stratum, we have 1,200 out of 2,000 households that um, responded. And in this strata here, we've got 2,000 out of 2,500. So in our two approaches, approach A, we just take the total, 3,200 over 4,500. That gives us our response probability of a 71%, and we need to take the inverse of that for our weight, so 1.406. And in our second strategy, we did each PSU separately, so we had 1,200 over 2,000, or 60% response rate for um, the first PSU, and the second PSU, uh, 2,000 over 2,500, or 80%. So reverse that for our uh, response weighting, 1.667 in the first PSU, and 1.25 in the second PSU. So if we now incorporate these weights, here, you've got the non-respondents in adult 2, 4, and 8, and you've got the design weights here. You've got for V1 approach A, everybody gets the same uh, weight, response weight, 1.406, but for the approach B, you can see that for the first PSU, the uh, uh, response weight is 1.667, and with the second PSU is 1.25, and then we can calculate our estimates as we showed before, but this time we need to compensate for these non-respondents. So the estimated percentage of smoking in approach A is going to be 71.3% and approach B 70.4%, but remember without any non-response the estimate was 61%. So you can see how much non-response, if it's very differential, you know, very selective, uh, how much it impacts on our estimates and the quality of our estimates. Uh, for estimated mean number of cigarettes smoked, approach A 43.2, approach B 42.3, and remember without the non-response, the estimate was 42.6. So that was just a small example. Hopefully it hit, you know, uh, provides a better understanding of uh, how we need to adjust for our survey uh, non-response. Just a little theory, I can't do anything without any theory. Um, the uh, bias of the unweighted estimator uh, we can look at uh, where if we have, if we take only the sample mean from the respondents, which is denoted by the little yr as the unweighted estimate of our population uh, parameter, in this case the population average, population mean, uh, we can sort of hypothetically 
think that our population may be split into two groups. You know, those that would respond and those that wouldn't respond. So that the expected value of our uh, y bar r would actually be the average of those respondents in our hypothetical population. If we were able to take our population and say those would have responded and those wouldn't respond. And so the bias would be this estimate, the, this value here, sort of the y average out of this hypothetical respondents minus our target parameter, which is the population mean, and I can manipulate that and do my algebra. But the point is that I end up with one minus the response rate times this uh, average uh, over the respondents minus the average over uh, non-respondents. And so my point in doing the algebra is to show you when do we have no bias in our estimates. And that will occur when either r bar is 1, in other words, everybody responds, right? So then it will be 0 on this term. Or the average of the respondents is equal to the average of our non-respondents in our hypothetical population. So that just shows you, you know, when, how we get this, um, bring down that bias uh, in the estimates. So I mentioned the weighting classes that we need to produce, uh, especially for post-stratification. Um, and the problem is, of course, we need the population values uh, for both respondents and non-respondents. And so in order to produce these weighting classes, we might use um, information on the strata or the primary sample units. We might have other information on our sample frames. I mean, I mentioned that uh, sam uh, government surveys often use address-based sample frames, but there's a lot of information from previous census about the social economic um, um, index of the area, which is highly correlated with income, etc. So there might be lots of external information that we can use in our sample frames. Sometimes, even though we have non-respondents, we might get a little bit of information about the household in terms of the household size and how many people live there. Um, obviously not a problem in longitudinal surveys, you know, when we get people uh, answering in and out of longitudinal surveys because then we know a lot of information from, say, a previous way. But the point is to produce those classes, because I showed you on the previous slide, where the uh, assumption is that it's uh, uh, non-selective within the class that the average of the respondents is equal to the average in, of the non-respondents. Um, and of course, if we get more, the more variation you have in the response rates, the better the class uh, will um, provide more efficiency and more power. And you have to remember that this uh, post-stratification method is, uh, produces these classes that are random, uh, have a random sample size, so they can't be too small. They have to be relatively large. In the, uh, our government surveys, we often use demographic estimates because, you know, the Office for National St Statistics produces every half a year um, estimates on the age and sex in the uh, geographical uh, area where people are living. Um, and so those uh, surveys are often um, used, uh, we use post stratification uh, according to those weighting classes. Uh, we might have in our business surveys, we might have business registers, lots of information from our VAT, from our tax data about businesses in terms of how many employees there are in a business. So we might have good registers or administrative data to get information about the population size to produce our weighting classes. Now you can also use high quality estimates from um, other surveys. The labor force survey, for example, is a very big survey. So the efficiency of the estimates are quite good, are quite low. And so you might want to use, say, the labor force survey estimates for various social economic um, variables. You do have to remember that if you use estimates, right, to produce our um, population totals, there is an element in the variance calculations that you need to account for because the auxiliary information are basically estimates and not true counts, but, but that is often done as well.
So as I mentioned, the Howitz-Thompson estimator is a very uh, good and unbiased estimate, but not very efficient. And uh, one way of um, providing more efficiency, again, is to use this auxiliary information that we might have. I denote this auxiliary information by x, so it could be your uh, age or your sex or where you live. And uh, it's a vector where we know for each category, say for males, females, we know the true total. Okay, so we know across the whole population how many men there are and we know how many women there are. So what we can do is provide something called a generalized regression estimator, so it's denoted by Y red, and it's simply the Howitz-Thompson estimator plus a correction. So what is this correction term? What you see in the parentheses is the difference between the known total, say the number of men that we have in the, in the United Kingdom, the known total, minus the estimate the Howitz-Thompson estimate of the men from my survey. So I have a Howitz-Thompson estimate from the men in my survey, and I know how many men are supposed to be in, my, in the population. Take that difference and multiply it by a uh, parameter B. Now B, those of you who are familiar with regression estimate, you can see it's similar to a generalized regression um, parameter. So basically, we're taking a Howitz Thompson, but we're going to adjust it. We're going to add something um, according to the difference between what I know is true in the population and what I'm estimating. So in fact, the Gregg estimators can be denoted again like a Howitz Thompson. This time, instead of the D, the design weight, I have a WI. And WI is simply this DI, the design weight times this correction factor gi, which I, I put there. So we're not you know, bothered about the formulas, but the idea is that we adjust the Howitz thompson using our auxiliary information and uh, uh, providing more efficient um, estimates. So what happens when we use these Gregg weights is that we have the property that all of the totals are benchmarked. So the fact that I have my sample uh, the number of men in my survey when I weight those up using the red weight, the W, that's going to be equal exactly to the number of men in the United Kingdom. So it's actually introducing these constraints, saying the weights have to be calculated in such a way that if I weight the men in my survey, it will be equal to the number of men that I, in the population that I benchmark to. You know, same with females or any other categories in this, um, um, in the, uh, in my auxiliary information. So it follows that the Gregg estimate of the population, you know, um, is the uh, benchmarks all of the survey estimates to the known population totals, and these uh, these are called the calibration constraints. Another really big advantage of using this uh, calibration, this Gregg weights, is that we can also do it in such a way that all, if we have cluster sampling, again, we're getting into designs, but we often have surveys where we have um, households, and then we investigate all the individuals in the household. For example, our uh, family resource survey is like that. And so we can make sure that all of the individuals in the household have the exact same weight. So we get consistency between household level estimates and individual level estimates. So there's consistency. Uh, so the Greg weights will do that for us. But the point is, is that by benchmarking to the known population totals, we get more accurate and more precise um, estimates. And another really good feature that national statistical institutes love is that the con their consistency um, consistent across all surveys. So let's say I'm always benchmarking men, women, right, in my many, many surveys that I carry it out in my organization. So anytime I produce a survey, the weighted count of men and the weighted count of uh, women, they're always going to be equal. It doesn't matter if it's the labor force survey, the family expenditure survey, the health survey, this or a social survey. 
And of course, national statistical institutes love that consistency. And of course, they're all benchmarked to, the, to their population um, known estimates. So the uh, consistency across surveys is a, well, is a good property for the um, national statistical institutes. So I know I, the aim here in this slide is because I talked a lot about post-stratification, and then I went into sort of this model-assisted approach you know, using these regression. But the fact is, is that post-stratification is actually a special case of the generalized regression estimators. So as I had in the uh, previous slide, I used these X's from auxiliary information. If you think of those X's as, uh, as um, indicators, one, if it belongs to the class, to the group, in other, in, for example, one, if you're a men, zero if you're a female, okay? So if uh, we're talking about categorical variables and our X or auxiliary information are actually indicators one, zero, if you belong to that subdomain or not, then if you run through that, uh, those formulas that I, I had on the previous slide, you will get that the grade weight, WI, is actually equal to our cap NH over little nh from the post-stratification method. So post-stratification is actually a special case of the generalized regression estimator. Post-stratified weights, again, we ensure that the benchmarking, that the um, weighted uh, total from our survey is actually equal to the known total. Okay, in this case, our, uh, the sum of the totals, because Xi is one zero, um, you know, if you're a man, you get a one, otherwise you get a zero. So the constraint is actually based on our weighted uh, survey count being equal to the um, cap NH, which we know. So post-stratification is simply a special case of this generalized regression estimation. We can use co continuous variables. I think this is my last slide. Um, so a lot, I've talked a lot about these classes which are defined by sort of cross-classifying these categorical variables, but of course we have in a lot of surveys, especially our business surveys, where our calibration constraints are actually continuous variables. For example, in the number of employees, which comes from the VAT, uh, from the uh, um, tax authorities. Um, and in this case, the simplest case would be to look at a ratio estimator. So I want to weight uh, my um, Y variable, which could be, say, turnover in a business, and I will weight that turnover by the known number of employees, right? CapEx is the known number of employees divided by my um, estimate from the survey of employees. So I will weight my WI, my Greg weight, is simply uh, cap X over the sum of XI. And you can see that if XI is one, uh, then we end up with the standard mean for all I, and then uh, and we can also get the means in the subdomains. So it's, um, we use, typically in business surveys, we'll use ratio estimation based on continuous variables. So the Greg allows us not just to look at uh, um, groups or classes, it also lets us benchmark to um, continuous variables. So I want to make sure that all of the employees, weighted employees in my survey is equal to CapEx, the number of employees in all of the UK according to the tax authority. So that's everything I wanted to say about survey weights.